Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, church, this will be the fifth time I've spoken to some of you this week in a sermon, and I don't have much left to say. And so we're just going to watch what's in the Bible with Buck Denver, and then we'll send you all home. How about that? Just an episode or two. You know, it's interesting. We're gathered here once again, and it just seems like there's so much that we could talk about, so much we could cover. So I'm thrilled that you've joined us this morning. Let's pray before we start looking at these two passages that we've read. God, I thank you for your word that's living and active, and I thank you for your spirit that's alive and well in us, your people, and that keeps calling us back to worship you, to hear from you, to receive from you. And so, God, this morning as we look again at your word, I pray that it would speak to us and that it would pierce our hearts and that it would transform us from the inside out, even as you've promised to do. And so, as I share now, as we gather now to hear from you, I pray that you would just edit what I have to say and that people would hear directly from you and hear words of life and truth and gospel good news from you. We pray this all in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. It was Christmas Eve, and the boss of a company had let everyone go and then ran into a problem. It was urgent. It was an emergency. And so he phoned one of his employees at home, and he was quite surprised when the phone was answered with a child's whisper, hello. And so he said, uh, was well, your father home? And the boy said, yes. Well, can I speak to him, please? It's quite important. No, said the voice. The boss was quite astounded by this, and he said, well, is your mother home? Yes said the voice. May I speak with her? No. The boss didn't know what to do and how to get past this child screening his call. And so he asked, is anyone else there? Yes. Who? The fireman. A fireman. What is the fireman doing here? He's talking with the policeman. Well, the boss was quite concerned now. Police, mom, dad, fireman, what is going on? All of a sudden, you can hear this racket in the background. He says, well, what is that? It's the helicopter landing. A helicopter, the boss says. What is going on? The SWAT team is coming out of the helicopter. SWAT team, mom, dad, fireman, policeman. What are they doing, he said. And the voice laughed back. They're looking for me. (laughs) And I'm curious this morning, what are you looking for? What were you looking for this Christmas? Did you get it? What are you looking for this Christmas season? What are you hoping for? What are your eyes and hearts and minds set on? I know for some of you, um, you had something quite particular in mind that you were hoping for this Christmas. Maybe it was a gift or a piece of clothing or a card or seeing a family member. All sorts of different things that we put our hopes on that we search and look for at Christmas. Some of them are quite small, maybe it's just a very small gift, but for sometimes it's quite big things, uh, reconciliation in the family, or even peace in a nation, or peace around the world, these big things that we're looking for. In Luke this morning, we read about uh, Jesus being brought to the temple, and there's two reasons. Mary also needs to go to the temple. Jesus is going there to be presented Um, because the firstborn son was uh, born for service to the temple, but then parents could redeem him, uh, essentially offer a a gift there, and then take their son back home with them um, from Old Testament practices and law. And then Mary also needed to go. After her mom gave birth, she was considered unclean for 40 days and then would go to the temple and offer a sacrifice and uh, be made clean. And most often that sacrifice was a lamb, uh, but we hear here about this exception for poor families, which includes Mary and Joseph and Jesus, a poor family that they could offer two birds. And so that's what this family does. But uh, something happens on this visit that we read about. While they're there, this man Simeon comes and sees Jesus and scoops him up into his arms. It's interesting. We don't know much else about Simeon. All we hear about is recorded right here, that he's righteous, that he's devout, that the Holy Spirit is on him. And so one day Simeon is out and about and the Holy Spirit uh, leads him into the temple, calls him to go into the temple. He goes in and sees this baby and knows instantly that it's the baby that's been prophesied about. Uh, See, the other interesting thing about Simeon is that God had told him, you will not die until you see the Messiah. What an amazing prophecy that would be to hear that prophesied over you, revealed to you from God, because they've been waiting for thousands of years for this Messiah to come. And yet Simeon is told, in your lifetime, 
in your lifetime with your very own eyes, you will see what we've been waiting for, what we've been longing for, what we've been searching for. Simeon, you will see this in your own lifetime. And so this day, Simeon's led into the temple, sees Jesus, and instantly knows that it's him. He scoops him up in his own arms and says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. Fascinating, isn't it? After thousands of years, this man we know nothing about except that he's faithful and righteous is the one who sees Jesus and knows that he is the Messiah. That for a thousand years, this is what they've been looking for and waiting for. And I wonder if Simeon, is this what you were expecting? Because the Holy Spirit didn't say it will be a baby, just that he would see the Lord's Messiah. And so was he waiting for a king or was he waiting for a politician or was he waiting for a, a military leader? What was he expecting? And yet all of a sudden he sees the baby and just knows this is the one. Now I can die in peace. God, you can dismiss me in peace because I've seen him. I've met him. I've met the Messiah. But there's so much in here that I think that they weren't expecting, that they weren't expecting that this would be a light to the Gentiles too, even though God had told them again and again and again and again and again throughout the Old Testament that this Messiah, this chosen one, this one who would come would be for all people, Israel, I still thought, think, was thinking very specific just to them. Even though he'd, uh, Abraham had been told uh, all people would be blessed through him. I was talking about the Messiah there, but I think they still thought just of us, just of them, just those specific people. It reminds me of an elderly couple who went into a fast food restaurant. They walk up to the till. They order one hamburger, one box of fries, and one drink and sit down at the table. They carefully divide the burger. They cut it in half. They count the fries one by one and uh, separate them. They get two straws, plunk them into the one cup. And other families sitting around say, that is so sad. They are so poor. They can't order two meals. Well, they go on and they start eating. Just the man, though, the wife just sits there silently watching him, sometimes taking her straw, taking a little drink. Well, the man takes slowly one bite after another. Finally, one couple sitting close by can't stand it, and the wife says, go and offer to buy them another meal. And so the husband gets up and he says, you know, we just want to help you uh, celebrate, and can I buy you another burger and fries? And they say, no, thank you. We're used to sharing everything. And so the man sits back down, and they continue this meal, the wife just sitting there watching, the man slowly, one fry at a time, one bite at a time, the wife taking one sip at a time. Someone else gets up and says, please, I would, it would be my honor to buy you something else. What can I get you? And they say, no, we are used to sharing everything. And they continue on their way. Finally, the man is about to finish. And this couple comes up and says, as they see the wife collecting her fries, collecting her burgers, say, we're just so curious. Can you tell us what you're waiting for? And she says, yes, the teeth. (laughs) (laughs) They're used to sharing everything, absolutely everything. Israel was not expecting this. They're waiting for the Messiah. What they never thought of, what they never imagined is that they would be sharing everything, including the Messiah, that the Savior of the world wasn't just for them, not just for Israel, not just for this nation, not just for this chosen people, but the Messiah, the Savior, was for everyone. And we read that on the Christmas Christmas Eve. We read that the Christmas story. That's for all people. Good news for all people. And, you know, sometimes we struggle with that too. We want to make Jesus just for us or just for the church or just for, you know, a certain selected group of people or denomination or people in the world, but it's not like that at all. Jesus says, uh, we're, it's revealed to us that it's all people. And we've kind of been talking about that every time we get together, that this good news is good news for everyone, that we share everything. Jesus was meant to be shared. The gifts that we've been talking about through Advent, the gift of uh, life and the gift of healing and the gift of enough for today and the gift of Jesus himself, all those things are gifts to be shared that Jesus gives to us. And so we read about that here. Simeon reveals that once again, makes it known that it will be for all people, a light to the Gentiles. 
And then we fast forward 30 years or so to the reading that I read from John. And it's about this festival that's going on and this division that's happening. Some people are whispering that Jesus is a good guy. Other people think, no, he's a deceiver. Another group of people is ready to kill him, waiting for him to come to this festival so they can just get their hands on him. Why all of this division? You know, Simeon prophesied about that too. I just want to read part of that again for you. Simeon said, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword, he's speaking to Mary, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. You know, Israel was thinking all good things. This Messiah would bring all good things to them, that it would bless them and make them a great nation once again and lead them on to glory. But here Simeon says it will also cause division, the falling and rising of many. People's hearts will be revealed. And we see that starting even at the Christmas story. As King Herod hears about this new king, what's he want to do? He wants to get rid of him, eliminate him. Some people listen to the shepherds. Others don't believe them. This baby boy that we celebrate at Christmas and we think of all good things, well, it's true, except in how people receive him and respond to him. Because not everyone does. Not everyone receives this as good news. Some people struggle with it. They're not ready to share this good news that the good news is for everyone, that grace is for everyone. It doesn't matter how good or bad you've been, what you've done, what you've said, it all comes down to Jesus. If you were here just uh, on Sunday, I think we talked about the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And so often we want to make more, make more rules around that, gather more things of things you have to do, this list of things you have to say or do or be or give, ways you have to behave. But Jesus says that's the sum total. It causes division. It causes division in Jesus' own lifetime. And we see it in the reading from John. How many of you at Christmas, uh, perhaps this Christmas or another one, how many of you received a family gift? Any of you have family gifts where it's meant to be shared? Yeah. How does that go? How does that go over in your family? Does it cause any division? It does for us. This is a family gift. It's mine, right? I want it first. Well, we're all going to share it. I had it first. Right? You want to wring the other kid's neck? I want to play with this first. Well, we see the same thing here with Jesus. He's mine. You can't have him. He's good. No, he's bad. I want it first. I want the gifts. I want the blessing. I want you don't get any. I'm keeping it all to myself. It's like opening up a box of chocolates with a family of four, and there's only three chocolates, and then, you know, a war breaks out, right? And you think, why did we ever do this? Why did we ever write family gift? This is a gift for everyone. Jesus is a gift for everyone. And there's all this fighting about him, and he's good or he's bad, or does he fulfill the prophecies or not? Well, Jesus does. He fulfills all those things. He comes to bring all good things. And yet here we see that not everyone will receive him. Not everyone receives him as good news because it messes up what they were thinking or wasn't what they were planning. I started this morning by asking you, what were you looking for this Christmas? What are you hoping for? Did you get what you wanted? What about Israel? Did they get what they were looking for? No. They got something infinitely better. But were they able to receive it? Were they able to see it? What were you looking for from God this year? Did you have a request from God? God, this year would you please? God, this year what we need? God, this year what we're hoping for and praying for? Did your family deliver? Did God deliver for you this year? You know, I think about the nation of Israel and think, how could they have been so blind that they miss Jesus? That they miss that he's the gift, the Savior, the one who's come to save the whole world, and that he fulfills all these prophecies that they've been looking at and studying and memorizing generation after generation, century after century, year after year. They've been focused on this Messiah coming, and yet he comes, and so many of them miss it, miss him miss the gift. How does that happen? And yet so often I look to God for something. I ask God for something or I'm praying about something for you. And I think I can put my own blinders on as well. 
and I lose track of a couple of things. One of them that I lose track of is that maybe God has a different answer to the request that's bigger and better than I was anticipating. Even if it's a longer road, a longer time to happen, even if it's a harder journey to get to the gift that maybe God has something in store that I didn't envision, but I should be trusting Him that He knows what He's doing, that He's God, that His ways and His thoughts are higher than my ways and my thoughts. What are we looking for from God and are we ready for Him to answer it the way that He wants to answer it? And then the second thing that stands out to me through these passages and perhaps more important. How often as we're calling out to God for this thing, this light at the end of the tunnel, and we forget about what he's already done in the past, that there's already a light, uh, a light in the darkness, a, a light to all people, a light that overwhelms all of the darkness. Jesus, how often am I holding on, just clinging for this one thing out there in the future and forgetting that God's already done absolutely every single thing that I need in Jesus? That absolutely everything is there and everything I'm looking for and hoping for and praying for is all gravy, really. That it's all extra, it's all on top, it's all additional, it's all upsizing what he's already given me. Because he's already given us Jesus already given us the Savior, already, not just for the nation of Israel, but for me, for my sins that I had to confess this morning silently. Because each and every day, each and every week, each and every year, there's more of them. And so I don't have to keep going to the future somewhere. I keep going back to Jesus. The same Jesus who was born and laid in the manger, the same Jesus who lived a perfect life, the same Jesus who went to the cross for me, the same Jesus who rose again for me. I don't need something else. I need just more of him to keep going back to him. And I can't lose sight of the gift that he's already given or I lose all the gifts together. That all of the goodness of God is wrapped up in Jesus. And it's through Jesus that he just keeps on giving us more and more and more. One blessing after another is how John, the gospel of John, starts out that his grace is more important than whatever I'm hoping for in the future, that his love is more important, that his forgiveness is more important, that there's nothing I'm going to unwrap or find under the tree that, compare, that can compare to the gift he's already given to me. I hope that you've had a great Christmas. I hope you keep having a great Christmas as we keep walking through this Christmas season, that you keep seeing God in action and his faithfulness in action and his blessings in action. And as you uh, unwrap another thing or visit another friend that you see again and again and again and again and again, that God keeps providing for you and loving you and blessing you and providing for you all through Jesus, all through the gift that Jesus gives of his Holy Spirit that somehow this year and this Christmas and in 2016 that we can stay Jesus-focused, that we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, because that's the gift that we've all come to celebrate. And as you see Jesus and um, interact with him, as you hear from him and read his words, may you also keep remembering that this is a gift to be shared. This is a gift for sharing. This is a gift that doesn't run out. This isn't a gift where you find out, oh, there wasn't enough. But this is a gift for all people. And so wherever you go and whoever you see and whoever you talk to and whoever you interact with and whoever calls or whoever you email or whoever you're texting with, whoever's your Facebook friend online, this is a gift for them, whether they know it yet or not. This is the gift that we can keep on sharing this Christmas and all year through. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.